Chris, thank you for coming today and uh, sharing your wisdom because we want to learn from you. And uh, uh, to start, can you please tell us uh, uh, about your beginnings? How did you uh, end up uh, in Wolverton? But what did you study first? Oh, going way back. Uh, so um, it's about 16 when I first thought about starting a, a business. Uh, and I went on to do physics at uh, university, thinking that maybe you know, I was going to be like a scientist, CTO, engineer, uh, and then worked in clean tech afterwards, you know, which was sort of quite important. Uh, and I was thinking about you know, starting a business in the renewable world. Um, this is sort of 2006, sort of six, five, uh, but super capital intensive. You know? So there was, a, there was a bit of a, you know, some funds were completely moving just to fund these clean tech companies but you, know, you needed to raise a few, several hundred million to do that. And I thought, that's going to be tough. I want to do a bit more on the consumer side, where you can be super capital efficient. I then wrote to a few funds. Benchmark was one. I said, will you let me hang out here for a couple of years? If I, if I stay too long, will you please fire me? Because uh, I want to start a business. And again, on the second anniversary of my time there, uh, about a week after we IPO Dukes, this, this large fashion company, um, you know, I, I left and about two days later started this business. Okay, so you left, and uh, how much work did you do in advance before you left? Uh, did you do some, some preparation, or you just left and thought you can figure it out yeah. on, on the go? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the time at Benchmark and at Balderton was, was actually like, sorry, phenomenal um, to help you sort of think through ideas, because you're meeting sort of eight to 10 entrepreneurs every uh, day who are super passionate, sometimes passionate about amazing ideas, sometimes passionate about, um, you know, not so amazing ideas, but they're all very passionate, and you're you know, constantly learning from, from their enthusiasm about what you know, might work, and then you get to, to see a bit more game film and see, okay, this company and this idea and this concept and this business model in this industry has worked very well. And so it's really like a, um, an amazing environment to, to, for curious people to learn more. And so even though like, my hat was firmly on how do I help uh, you know, the, the team make great investments, you know, subconsciously, there's all these sort of ideas percolating. And, uh, you know, I really began to zero in on fashion as a space where I felt it was sort of underserved. Um, and it was kind of the last major industry to move online. And there was certain things that we could learn from, weirdly, the music industry or even the travel industry, which had kind of played out maybe five, ten years prior. Yes. To, to bring to this, this uh, you know, very um, significant industry. Would you say fashion is your passion? I'd say, I'd say it's one of them. I'd say I'm, I'm a pr pretty, uh, got many passions. I'd say technology is probably the underlying passion, you know, um, but you know, right now I've been super happy to, to, to you know, problem solve in the fashion space. And I think it's difficult to spend all day every day in a space that you don't find uh, interesting or engaging. Yes. Um, I'd say like there are, there are two sorts of entrepreneurs uh, that sort of come across. There are some folks who are just like obsessed about a space, people who just like live, breathe music, and they're just gonna, they feel this pain about how the music industry is broken and how they want to fix it. And, and there are others who are much more like problem solvers and opportunity uh, seekers, uh, you know, people who, who you know, love, love these puzzles. Uh, and they're I'm much more, I think, of the second sort. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, it is, um, I think fashion has been a fantastic thing for me. But if I was to start another business at some point, you know, it doesn't have to be fashion for me. There, there are plenty of other areas that I'm interested okay. in. Okay. So when you started, uh, let's talk about the journey because I like to understand, you know, when, when I have this uh, passion for fashion, I want to, uh, it's a big opportunity, but how do you start? What's the step one? Do you raise money first? Do you for, first build something to test the idea? Or what's your first step? Yeah, so I think there were, there, were, there were two approaches. One was, you know, with the sort of the business hat, where do I think there's, the timing is right uh, and the sort of competitive space is going to allow for this new opportunity? And then the second one is like on the customer need. Um, and, you know, I spent a lot of time on that second piece. So, you know, I, I built the first version of the website myself. I, you know, traipsed around to the houses of anyone who would, you know, have a cup of tea with me. Did you use a template like Vix or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it was it was it was pretty pretty scrappy. So uh -huh. I, I built it in the weekend, which is and I'm, I'm not really a good coder, so it was a, yes. it was some sort of a pretty simple template, and it had one product on it, uh -huh. one product, and I was like, imagine this had like other things. Would you use it? And everyone hated it. Uh, everyone hated almost everything about it, apart from this tiny bit that's like, well, that could be interesting. And then that guy, did, that guy did it us in terms of how we wanted to do it. And then I met my co-founder who said, uh, you know, if you never touch another line of code again, we can do this together, which okay. is a good move. 
Um, and yeah, and we continued really thinking about these two things, the product market fit, so understanding what the customers wanted, and also product channel fit, which is you know, how, how do we bake in from the very beginning the way to like scale this to the sort of scale that we were very keen on uh, from day one. So when you were building it, uh, what kind of uh, insights did make you understand that this is something which is worth pursuing at the very early beginning? Yeah, I mean, as I said, like from those early customer conversations, there were bits where people said, this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we could then, in a pretty quick way, get a prototype up. Uh, you know, one of the, you know, the, the foundations of our business, and sorry, maybe not everyone knows what we do, so I should probably say, like, we... Can you please raise your hand if you uh, have not heard about the list of YST? Okay, and uh, raise your hand if you have used it or seen the website. Okay, so we, you know. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, so, so having, having this huge um, data set, in fact, the largest uh, data set of uh, fashion products live in real time is a core foundation. A bit like if Spotify didn't have every, every song, it would be an issue and for us to have. And we were very fortunate that uh, to get all the items onto list was actually probably more straightforward for us than it was for Spotify to get the deals with the record labels. Yes. And so really within a, you know, a couple of months, we were able to get something live and test both the product market fit and the product channel fit hypotheses and get that sort of feedback. And um, yeah, we definitely retain that very strong bias of like, get something out as quickly as possible. This idea of like duct tape programming. So like programming beautiful things we don't really care about uh, unless it's very, very high likelihood of being important. You know, just, just programming whatever is the quickest way to get a signal to start learning. Yes. That's like a, a guiding principle from day one for us. Mm -hmm. But how did you make the first, uh, how did you convince the first uh, clients to or how did you show the first products on your uh, website to, to sell? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, 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 there was like two, two acquisition strategies which we felt from the travel industry gave us a good feeling that we could, oh. we could uh, use. You know, paid search and SEO, nothing, not rocket science at all. Yes. And uh, because there was nobody who had the sort of data set that we had, uh, the SEO engine started ticking pretty well within paid search. You know, you can spend small amounts to start learning. And then, uh, you know, coupling that live data with user testing. And so. did you have your own inventory at the beginning? No. And how did you do it? How did you do what? Uh, did you go and buy the stuff in the shop? No, 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 we, no, we never, never. So, um, you know, we went to partners and said, you know, we're building this thing, it'll be big, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and made it like very painless for okay. them. So we built all the technology to say, look, you don't, literally don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. We will build, you know, spiders and scrapers as it was back then, just to okay. like suck it all up. And they were like, "Okay, what's the downside?" And uh, yeah, making it making it painless for them and a no-brainer was. Um, and thankfully, they were happy to take a, a small risk on us. Yes, so this is a company called Zappos in the US, which uh, and apparently uh, the, the urban legend says that the, the the founder at the beginning he just went to a shoe store and uh, asked them, "Hey, would you give me ten percent discount?" And if you would, and uh, he was listing those shoes and. Only after he sold uh, a pair of shoes on the website, he would go to the shop and buy it, yeah. and then go yeah. to the post office <coughs> to sell it. So he didn't do this this, this way. Yeah, but there is. I mean, there's there's a lot of obsession around like how does my company scale, uh, and I think there is there's a really nice uh, Paul Graham article about like first of all doing things that don't scale, exactly, you know, yes. Airbnb as well. So you can validate it, and then like you can just find a way to scale it afterwards. And can you please zoom into this? In what was this in your case? What were the things you were doing at the beginning uh, which you can't scale? Um, I mean, certain, certainly the user testing is, um, you know, it gives you a signal, but it's not statistically significant. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Maybe, 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 I mean, just by the virtue of our model, a lot of the things we did just happened to scale um, early on. But, okay. Uh, uh, we will for any questions. Uh, you can, you can uh, ask away. We have lots of opportunities to, to, for you to, to ask any questions. If you uh, like a question, you can, you can uh, highlight it and then we'll ask the most of the questions. It's super simple. All you have to do is just pull out the mobile phone and open your browser. That's it. And you type in slido.com and the hashtag is startup guy. It's that simple. So feel free to ask away. And uh, uh, let's, let's zoom into the first question from Ben uh, here. <coughs> Fashion is so diverse. How important is diversity to you as an entrepreneur? Hugely on, on multiple lenses. Uh, I mean, there is the idea of the team. You know, we are, I think all startups are typically trying to build something new. So uh, having lots of different perspectives, opinions is very important. We're not like following a playbook, turning the handle. So I think that is, uh, on the team, it's very important for us. And we, we actually send every 
uh, I think six months, an email to the team saying, look, this is where we are, this is where we're aiming to be on various different uh, lenses. You know, in terms of actually what our product does, uh, you know, we try to um, you know, cater for fashion lovers you know, in, in any, 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 uh, any sort of diverse form. And you know, we try to do a lot of personalization right now. I think the, the options that fashion shoppers have today are not typically personalized. I'll go to this store, and this store might have three or four personas, and you know, some editor is thinking, I'll buy for this person. Whereas you know, the, the For You section on the app, we really try to, uh, to make it super personalized to whatever you're interested in. And I think that obviously goes hand in glove with diversity as well. Um, you know, we try to help people make the best decisions. That's kind of what, we're, what we exist for. Um, you know, initially, that was like, can I find it in my size? Can I find it in, 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 in a price that's uh, not gonna, you know, I'm not going to overpay? Yes. But increasingly, those decisions, uh, particularly um, you know, as the consumer base evolves, are factoring like uh, other things, like sustainability. You know, and not everyone's going to care about sustainability, but increasingly more people do. And we want to make sure that when people are making purchase decisions, the ones who care about sustainability are able to make decisions. So you really want to. Okay, yeah. uh, uh, Chris, I want to understand uh, when you were uh, ready for fundraising, uh, it's obviously, it seems it was easy for you, no? Because you, you, you came from a VC company. <coughs> Did you just have one uh, investor meeting or you had several yeah. before you raised your funds? Yeah, I, I, think, I don't think it was. Uh, yeah, definitely was not easy. Uh, it was easy to get the conversations, the first meetings, but I think you know the lens that we were judged through, uh, or, or, yeah, it was the same as, as everyone else. We definitely had to prove it. Um, you know, in the in the very beginning, uh, you know, we had a seed round, and we were lucky to be oversubscribed. We ended up raising twice as much as we needed. Nice. We then um, ran out of money, so did a convertible. Really? Okay. Um, which uh, so lesson there was. Was like, it we, stressful? Yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, we were trying to trying to find like exactly what the right mix was, and, and actually early on, one of the hypotheses we had was around social commerce. Again, 2010, Zuckerberg mm -hmm. was saying like after games, commerce is going to be the next big thing to blow up. You know, a lot of these uh, on Facebook, a lot of uh, big retailers were building yes. these, these huge stores in pages, and um, you know, same time as Pinterest was coming up and a few other businesses, and we just couldn't get it to work. And at, at one point, we had to say, look, how much how much conviction do we have in this approach? versus what else can we see in the business that's working really well? Um, and it was a super tough decision because it's a gut choice. Yes, you, know, yes. you, you can look at the data, the data's still gonna tell you something, but like, you know, knowing when to, to cut and, and pivot is, um, is always gonna be an intuition you know, formed by some of the data. And so we actually stopped all, all the social stuff in 2010. A lot of the searching was really getting much more traction, so we're like, we're gonna go all in there. You know, and we had you know, six months with a convertible to prove that that was gonna be the thing. Uh, otherwise, it would have been game over. Yes. And so regarding the business model, uh, you said you had this idea of social, social commerce didn't work out. How many ideas did you have to test un until you landed on the, on the sweet yeah. spot? So you have like these sort of uh, like big ideas and then small ideas within them. So it's a little bit like you're looking at a mountain range and maybe there's like a bunch of mountains and you're trying to see which one is their goal and what are the approaches to go in. Yes. So within social, there was maybe five or six different approaches we tried. And at that point, we were like, OK, there's probably not gold in that mountain. And then we switched the other one. So six, I don't know, five or six approaches within that social concept. And then the second mountain, the second major thing we tried was search. And that was much, uh, much more successful. OK, so and you have the, the search is the main uh, revenue source, or you have other, other ones? So um, I mean, the way that we make money as a business is when a customer comes to us and finds something they love, and they buy it from a partner, we will take a commission. Yes. Um, but the modes or the missions that the customer has, there's a few of them. So the, one of the main ones for us, certainly at the beginning, was a customer knows the item she wants, and she doesn't know where she can find it. She doesn't know who's got it in her size, and she does not want to pay more than she needs to. That mm -hmm. feeling of like the next day seeing it somewhere else for less was, was, was yes. something we kept hearing about. And so that was kind of the easiest place for us to start growing. But now we really think about three missions. So there's that search. There's, there's kind of what we call browsing, which is somebody has a need, but they don't know the item that will fill that need. So if someone's got an invitation to a wedding or is on a job interview and they're like, mm, what shall I wear? I need something smart shoes. We want to help that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, discovery, when I have no idea what I want. And this really fits into entertainment. And you know, very few people will go onto Amazon for entertainment looking at the new hammers or That's true. stuff like that. I don't, I don't. Yeah, but, but, but in fashion, you know, most of our shoppers tell us that every day they are you know, on shopping sites browsing around. And it's fun. It's entertaining. It's cathartic. They'll do it after Instagram. And this is such a such an amazing uh, quality for our business where 
you know, we, we try to understand, okay, how are people getting entertained today and how do we kind of feed into that and can we make it me meaningfully better than the status quo? And actually, uh, this is very similar to how I think Spotify look at the world. With Spotify, you can search for any artist, album, DJ, it's and it's guess. there. Mm -hmm. If you want to go to the gym or have a barbecue outside, they've got playlists for that. And if you have no idea what you want to listen to, it's going to personalize, give you personalized recommendations so you're always discovering new cool stuff. And, um, you know, actually one of our board members who's in the music industry for, I don't know, 15, 20 years is now running digital at LVMH. And I was doing things in music as well prior, and it was interesting to us that actually quite a few people have gone from, from music into fashion because they're both very culturally relevant verticals with a lot more parallels than some of the, the, the hammer-buying parts true. of commerce. That's true. You mentioned music we had here in, uh, in December. Uh, uh, the manager, Robbie Williams, literally had, uh, he said, hey, I have to go because in half an hour I need to be at Wembley uh, meeting Robbie Williams as a concert, so I <laughs> had to run away from here. But I, I love how you uh, state your mission is you'd like to, you, you want to do for fashion what Spotify did for music. Hmm. It's a very big mission. Uh, how much uh, energy did it, did it take you to convince uh, your suppliers to let you do that? I mean, actually, the suppliers... Um we were very lucky, actually. Most of them, because again, it was very low risk for them, and we got sort of once once the machine kind of got ticking over, the growth was sort of triple digit. I think every year for the first five six years, and still is very strong now. So for them, it's like low risk. I need to get I need to get new customers from somewhere. You know, they they knew that like oh, in the physical world, I might go into Bond Street, I might have a shopping mall. Surely digitally, we need an equivalent, mm -hmm. and so that was yeah. So convincing the suppliers was was I think never the most never the biggest challenge. It was more like, how do we make sure we keep on getting customers to, to discover us, to use us, to stay loyal to us? And if you can do that, then the suppliers will always be wanting to join, providing it's pretty frictionless for them to come yes. on. So in the tools you can, you can work with, apparently you don't do anything with price, right? So you, you don't change prices, you don't uh, yeah. touch that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Whatever. Oh. I mean, a lot of what we do, the customer comes from us, she makes the decision, having spent a bunch of time, and then she's like, okay, I'm now going to go to this retailer site or brand site to execute my decision. Yes. And because the, she's going to that site to make the, to, to execute to to buy, there can't be any price difference. Uh, sure. And but also partners feel very strongly about that. There's you know a, a lot of fear about like um, are people destroying my brand equity by discounting surreptitiously or uh, otherwise. And and we have always been very clear that the price on the retailer site or the price on the brand site is the All price right. on our site. So you have uh, you have six million uh, products. How many brands do you have on your website? Yeah, it's, it's about 8 million now, uh, and it is uh, 18,000 18, different brands, Okay, and then about 125 million shoppers. Interesting. And if we deep dive into the, into the KPIs, uh, like when it comes to uh, you selling for big brands, uh, I was surprised to see how, how significant the chance is. So, for so example, you have big brands, and you, you s how much of, of, of their stuff are you selling on your website? Yeah, I mean, for, for, for some, some of the leading brands, we're doing about half of their e-commerce now okay. in some of the key markets for them. Okay, so about half. That's yeah, impressive. in some cases, uh, yeah. Are they nervous about uh, selling through you and losing that commission, or they they, they fine with uh, Again, I mean, like lists of some of their stuff? These, these brands will pay uh, the, for rent in Bond Street or in a shopping mall. Uh, you know, they, they, the model has always been that we need to go where affluent customers are or, or not affluent customers, our customers are. Yes. And what we have successfully done is aggregated the customers. And so, you know, it's a marketing cost, which I think they're all super familiar mm -hmm. with. Again, it's, it's been, it's been the, you know, it's all sorts of pain in starting up the business, but getting suppliers to come on <coughs> has not been one of the biggest pain points. And how did you first start started to bring your customers uh, on board? Uh, how did you find them? Was it on uh, in, in paid ads or... Uh, some are physical, yeah, on fashion, it, fashion catalogs. Oh yeah, no, it, was, it, was, it was paid ads and SEO to start with. And uh -huh. SEO is kind of the organic Google listing ads. Yes. And uh, again, we had conviction that those channels would work because we saw that not many people in our space were doing them very well. And a lot of travel businesses or real estate businesses and, and, and many others had that kind of dual prone strategy. And then those things started to work well and we just kind of invested more and more uh, in each of them. Okay. And uh, how much funding did you raise in total so uh, far? So it's about 80 or 90 million US yeah. dollars. And how big is the team now? It's about 150. 150. And what's your plan? What's your, uh, how, how much do you want to grow your team uh, to fulfill your vision? Yeah, I mean, I'd rather not grow my team at all. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Well, I mean, I'm gonna get, we have to, but like, you know, every time you grow the team, you become slightly slower, less agile. Yeah. Um, you have to invest more in culture uh, to make sure everyone really understands what you care about. You have to invest more in processes. And so 
talking about like the size of your team as a badge of honor, I've, you know, I've kind of thought like, wow, if you can if you can do something amazing with very few people, like what WhatsApp did or Instagram did, I was like, wow, that's that's the dream. But but for, you know, for us, you know, the, the the objective we have is we want to be you know the the leading app uh, in 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 the fashion space for fashion mm -hmm. lovers. You know what Spotify have achieved in, in music, and I think to do that we will need uh, uh, more people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot, um, as I mentioned, in these different customer journeys which people build for. Um, you know, we're internationalizing quite quickly, so we're now in about a dozen different languages as of the last sort of 15 months. Um, and the world around us is changing quite quickly. Like mobile was not a thing when we started, and mm -hmm. now it's the dominant platform. And so. Yes. Uh, we will continue to hire to, to meet those needs. Okay, you mentioned WhatsApp, and uh, you know, we had Jan, uh, Jan Colton, the founder, on, on our stage uh, two years ago, and uh, he was mentioning that uh, when he first built the first version, it was about uh, not a messaging, it was an address book which tells you who, which one of your friends is online. Yeah. And when he launched it, he was super excited and nobody used it. Yeah. Like literally no one. Yeah. And, and he didn't understand why. And then uh, what happened, uh, Apple uh, iPhone uh, launched notifications. And then they figured that maybe they don't just send notifications that your friend is online, maybe they can find out a way how to send the message uh, uh, in the notification. And that's how WhatsApp just took off. Wow. And uh, uh, it was very hard at the beginning. And I know that when you, when you started, it was also, uh, you had a uh, low point where uh, you were in the kitchen in, in, a, in, in an office somewhere. Tell us what happened. Yeah, actually, a lot of my low points happen in kitchens. Uh, so, it's true, yes. so, so this was, um, well, going way back, I quit my job. I was kind of running on my savings. And, you know, I knew that I needed a technical co founder to manage these large data sets. I knew data would be important. And I'm trying to find who this person should be. And uh, I find this guy who we spend a bunch of time, a lot of late nights, uh, talking about the idea, planning it. And he is going to come in and sign the contract at, uh, I think, Monday morning at 1.30. And at 1, I get the text message, sorry, taking job somewhere else. And I was like, wow. well, what? Text message. What, what, yeah, yeah. What, like, what is this? Like, there was, no, there was no talk about the process, nothing else. It was all kind of agreed. And, and I was working out of um, a friend's office at the time, a, friend, a college friend who started a business called Songkick, and who's kind enough to give us a couple of free desks. And so I'm there like in the kitchen, just like making a very bad cup of tea, thinking like, what, what, is, what has happened? Uh, and one of the founders came in and was like, Chris, you look, you look terrible. Tell me what, what's going on. And I was like, you, you'll never believe this dreadful thing has happened. And he started laughing. And he's like, come, come take your tea out on the stoop, and I'm going to tell you what happened to us in our first six months. <laughs> And I, was, I felt brilliant after that. Wonderful, brilliant. Yeah. brilliant. Because, yeah. because you know, they had just like <clears throat> 10 times worse tragedies every week for the first six months. And it wasn't Schadenfreude. It was just like understanding that for this company, which I admired, for every company I admired probably, that these sort of setbacks, which feel dreadful at the time, are actually totally normal. And I wasn't sort of terribly unlucky or being singled out or anything. It's just like, this is, this is what to get used to. And it, and it was, yeah, I just like knowing that it was normal was the best part for me. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, oh, in that case, we can have like a whole bunch of other setbacks. And because everyone else did and got through it, we'll, we'll be able to do it as well. OK. So you survived, and now here you are. Uh, okay. let's, let's talk about uh, your company processes and how you run the company. So how would you summarize your company culture? So we had, um, I mean, I think every company has a culture. And I think we, for the first 50 people, had a culture that we didn't bother codifying. And because my co-founder and I interviewed and met everyone, um, it was pretty coherent. Do you still hire? Uh, do you still interview everybody who comes in? Uh, not everybody, uh -huh. but I'd say certainly the the many many of them, and certainly all, every every senior uh -huh. hire. Uh, there are some people who say you should hire, interview the first five hundred. Yes. Um, you don't. I don't, but I can see there's merit in that. But I believe that if you do a really good job of codifying your culture, like a lot of what you want to do as a founder is like make yourself scale. Um, so you're not co writing all the code, you're not making every decision. And culture is kind of that operating system that allows you to make yourself scale. So yes. I would argue you may not need to do that if you, if you can invest. So when we went to 50 to 100 people, uh, the wheels came off because we didn't codify it. And the, the second 50 people who we didn't interview, my co-founder and I, um, we're, very, we're very good, but believed in very different things to what we believed. Uh, and because culture is like this operating system, you'd get two people in a room to try to solve a problem, and they couldn't agree on an approach to solve the problem. You couldn't even get started in the problem solving. Um, and these, these things are like religions. There's no like right or wrong. But if you have two people with different religions having this discussion, it can get pretty dysfunctional. And the symptoms look like, oh, Bob and Sue really don't like each other. What's up with that? And then you kind of like 
get Bob and Sue to be friends again, and then like, you know, two other people have issues, and you're kind of playing whack-a-mole thinking, what is going on? And then you realize that, oh, there's something fundamentally wrong, which is we didn't codify the culture, which meant that when people were hiring, they didn't really make sure that we put everyone through the paces to say, look, do you care about the same things as us? Um, and it took us about a year to, to kind of overcome that mm -hmm. huge issue. And so we take the culture stuff really seriously because of the scar tissue around uh, what happened when it went wrong. Yeah, it's my fault. And how do you uh, screen for that? If, you, if you're hiring new people, how do yeah. you make sure they are the kind of people you want to have in your company? Yeah, so, so you know, we obviously have to look at the capabilities, but within the culture specifically, there is um, at least one specific culture interview that we run with two people who have been trained to do the culture interview. But of course, in every other interview, when we have the wash up, people we're talking about, you know, culturally, this is a bit weird, as well as like capabilities along, along the way. Um, and then, of course, once they are hired, we do, um, you know, I sit down with every new hire and run through the culture deck that we have. Um, and then we will just make sure that, like, the deck does not sit in a drawer. Uh, and it really touches things that we do every week. So I send, like, a week that was email every week to the whole company, and I will specifically call out where people have been championing some of the values that we okay. have. So it's, it's a really big deal. Uh, and I must admit, like, before we felt the pain you kind of feel like you've got you know, so many problems. Is culture really going to be the problem? You read these blog posts. There's that famous thing where Peter Thiel was asked by the Airbnb founders after he invested, Peter, like, what is, what's the most important thing? Is it like the, the legal stuff? Is it like the partners? Is it the videos? And, and Peter, in, in, in his uh, colorful language, said, like, yeah, it's just one thing. Don't fuck up the culture. And so I was reading this blog post thinking, like, yeah, 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 the culture, the culture. But like, this is all on fire. Yes. And having been through the pain of that, 100% you know, believe that, that you know, the culture is one of the, the, the critical things to make sure you don't, you don't yes. sort of get wrong. There was a, there was a talk with uh, Sarah Fry, Fryer from, she's, she was the CFO of Square, a, 20, a 33 billion dollar company. Yeah. She just left and she is now uh, CEO of Nextdoor. Yeah. And she was saying that uh, uh, when she came from, I think from Goldman, uh, she came to, uh, to Square. She was literally telling people, look, she has, she has two kids, uh, I'm going now to, to, to a concert with my kid, I'm going to come back, uh, just to make sure she, she wanted to implement the, the, the knowledge that it's okay to, to have uh, yeah. social interactions in, in the company, it's not just one world and the other, because apparently when she was at, uh, at, the, at the bank, there used to be people who had two jackets in, in the office, they left one jacket on the chair, having other people think they, they still work. And it's not something, this kind of fake out we don't want, uh, when you when you hiring, uh, what kind of key hires uh, do you still uh, need to have in, in the company uh, to fulfill your vision? Okay, well, I think there's sort of two things there. The, the, the point that Sarah makes, I think, is, is actually a really important one. And you know, I, when I started the business, I didn't have any kids, and I got two little girls. And you know, tonight maybe is an exception, but like for the most part, I am home to put them to bed every every day. Mm -hmm. nice. uh, and that's super important to me. And I think. Uh, it's also important for me to show the, the company that like, if I'm doing it, then they don't need to have this two-jacket nonsense. Um, but uh, yeah, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll work in the other times to get everything done. And I think there is you know, a lot of chat about burnout. And I, I really strongly feel that burnout is what happens when you sacrifice stuff that you don't want to sacrifice. And that's different from different people. Some people are very happy to wake up at 4 in the morning uh, and get on to talk to a team in a different country to make the time zones work. And those same people might be super unhappy to miss their kids' soccer game or ballet recital or whatever. Yes. Um, and so making sure people have the freedom to make those choices themselves in a kind of grown-up way, I think is really important to our culture. And also, in that grown-up way, they, will, you know, they know what's expected and will, will find a way to manage their time to make sure they you know, are, can do the things that they're accountable for. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, strongly feel about that. And, and also, there is this about having kids, this belief that like, oh, once you have kids, you become super efficient, uh, super efficient at everything. Do you? Is it true? No, complete lie. You don't? I think it's, uh, well, for me, it's a complete lie, and I think uh -huh. it's a really unhelpful lie, because when you suddenly find that this isn't happening to you, you're like, oh, what am I doing wrong? This is, you know, I'm the same efficiency, I just have more, more commitments, and, um, you know, I want to balance that as well as I can between my passion for, 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 for the company and, and for my family, and I want to make sure that everyone else feels the same in that, but this sort of belief that something magical happens, mm -hmm. and uh, I just don't think it's very helpful. Okay, uh, we'll have uh, an investor Q&A after this, but I want to know, uh, you have a few very good invest investors in your, in your company, can you tell us what is the best value you're getting from them, 
Uh, and and how, what is the best way for a founder like you to manage your investors and make sure they can bring value to, to the company? Um, well, so I think cho choosing your investors is, is, a, is a life decision, uh, you know, but you, a life decision you make after like a few dates. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, there's a, a, a symmetry there, and I was fortunate to know many of our investors. If I look at people on the board, many of them I've known for 10 years or many years prior to that. And that was just very fortunate that that, that happened because I was spending time in, in that world and other sheer coincidences. But um, uh, yeah, to make sure you know who, who you know, you're getting, getting to be involved in the company and it's very asymmetric as well because they can fire you and you can't really fire them typically. So um, don't rush this decision and when you know, don't get blinded by the dollar signs. Uh, honestly, having a good board member and a bad board member can make huge differences. I mean, I've heard about board meetings where literally vases were flying through the air, uh, and that is not a board meeting you want to be in. How do you prepare? Do you do uh, 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 information deck for them before the board? Yeah. And do you, yeah, I mean, uh, what do you expect from, from a good board? Uh, board like, I mean, uh, there's there's a bunch of philosophies here. So what's yours? You know, so so for me, um, I really like doing one on one with the board members. Uh, and each board member typically has like a, a sort of superpower that I will go to them for to say, look, I'm really uh, struggling with this or I'm really unsure about that. This is what I feel, talk me off the ledge, et cetera. And I, I just think like one-on-one -on -one environments, coffees are really the best environments for that. I don't think board meetings, the way I like them, should have like any major surprises. Mm -hmm. So I like to kind of circulate any, you know, super good news or super bad news with them beforehand. Um, and we also have quite a big board. And that's, that is not great. You know, we've, we've raised uh, you know, a bunch of money. We've had you know, uh, four or five different rounds. And it, having like, a lot of people in the boardroom means like, detailed conversations are quite tough. Um, and so that's why you know, traditionally what we've done is have the you know, one-to-ones where I can get like, a lot of the value add. And then a lot of the board meetings, the way we use them typically, is a chance to like, align everyone mm -hmm. Um, you know, periodic to make sure everyone knows that same thing, care things, and then we're going to have the next one to one with them all. They will be fully up to speed. Now, there is a there's a bunch written out there that says that's not the way to do it, and uh, you know, so this is again like religions. So there's a bunch of different mm -hmm. ways, and, and there's no that definite it works way. For you, right? But this one, this works yeah. for us. Okay, let's do the last five minutes to uh, get some questions from the audience. From the audience, Sean is asking. Most of your counterparts are set to announce the figures this coming week. The numbers are not looking so great in terms of losses and CPA. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I expect this is to do with the sort of COVID-19, which is um, in, our, in, in many industries, but particularly in our industry, has just been um, devastating. So uh, and I don't want to be insensitive here, because obviously it is devastating in, in a very human sense mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but you know, within fashion, the Chinese consumer is kind of the, 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 the engine of the industry. Um, you know, anyone who's been on Bond Street or Fifth Avenue or Avenue Montaigne will, 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 will know that firsthand. Uh, and obviously, you know, some of the figures that we've seen are, you know, quite dramatic in terms of um, in-store sales going down. Now, online, that doesn't seem to be playing out. Certainly, in our figures, uh, the growth is accelerating and we have, to, you know, but we don't do much in China. We don't do mm -hmm. much in these affected markets. Um, but of course, if our partners are hurting, then that, that we're very sensitive to, to, to that, and we are you know, actively talking about how can we best support them in mm -hmm. this time of need. But yeah, this is, this is a major body blow to, to many people in the, in the sort of mm -hmm. wider industry, uh, and who knows how long it will mm -hmm. last. Can we discuss your revenues? Uh, how much revenues did you have last year? Uh, I'm trying to think what we've announced. Oh. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd say that the probably the last public figure is in terms of top line sales, you know, pushing on uh, you know, three, 400 million. Okay, and what's your last valuation in the company? It's not this one. Nice try. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, uh, we have a question from Marie from uh, from uh, Robert. Uh, and the question is, uh, what I think are incredible business ideas, concepts, but very difficult deciding which one to go mm -hmm. for. Any, any advice? Because he has yeah. lots of ideas. How do you? How did you decide uh, that that fashion e-commerce was, was the idea you wanted to go for? Yeah, so I mean, I, I I'm sure you had many many other ideas. Lo right? Loads of ideas, uh, and um, one of the, again I mentioned that the time I spent in, in the investing side of Balderton and Benchmark was super helpful because, uh, you know, let's say I, let's say I be um, well, the, the the people the partners there are thinking about you know, good, what is a good idea, what is a bad idea, mm -hmm. all day every day. And so, you know, whenever I had any any idea, the first thing I'd say is like to to one of the partners there, saying like, I thought about this. What do you think? And they'd say, 
Chris, that's a terrible idea for these 17 reasons. So we're testing a video in a circle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh -huh. and I think, like, for me, that's the first stage. It's just, like, talking to friends yeah. and saying, like, what do you think? And, and, I mean, I don't think this is so true now, but certainly in the past, people used to be very precious about their ideas. This is my idea. No true. one's had it. And true. it's a bit like, you know, like the idea is like climbing Everest. You know, having the idea to climb Everest is not the great idea. Actually, climbing that mountain, that's the, that's the hard thing. And so... Um, certainly 10 years ago, that sort of Silicon Valley culture, I don't think it permeated London quite so much as it is now. But mm -hmm. So stage one, sh sharing it with friends whose opinions I trust. You know, stage two, maybe going wider to people who don't know me and who are just like testing this on a customer basis and making it very clear that they're not going to do me any favors by saying, oh, this is a good idea because they're my friend. And then thirdly, building something as quickly as possible. It can be a paper prototype or a real prototype to, to, to get it through. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many ideas, and you know, just today I was talking to a friend of mine who was thinking about their next thing, and you know, every week they're pinging me an email saying, what about this, what about that, and I'm sure he's doing that with a dozen or two dozen different friends, and I think that's a, a great starting point, but okay. the point you made about Jan at WhatsApp, I think, is, is also super important, which is, you know, a dress book for online, like, he clearly thought it was a great idea, his friends clearly thought it was a great idea, yeah. but not getting married to it is, uh, and, and, and then looking for the signals. You know, if this is clearly failing, is it a failing everywhere? Mm -hmm. Or is it like with this particular customer or this particular use case that you've never thought about the inside is, is attraction? Yes. So the question is, a uh, quick question, quick answer uh, from Mark. Uh, what are the top five AI trends in the fashion sphere in the coming five years? This, uh, this, this fashion, e-commerce fashion company in the US, a uh, unicorn company, which apparently gets about 85, 90% of revenues from the stuff they recommend to the customers. Uh, how good is your recommendation engine, or how do you match uh, clients, or what are the AI trends, or the, the, how smart is your tech? Yeah, well, I mean, so, so for, for us, we, we use real AI mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a number of ways. What, what does it mean? In, in well, I mean, so we're like building, building models that will continue to learn, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we're fortunate to have like vast amounts of customer data and product data, probably okay. more, more than most of the people, and then building training models on the, those data sets independently and how they interact with each other uh, to That's do our house. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. To do that, either predictive in terms of the recommendations that we give customers, also to do predictive classification to say when this item comes through, we need to know everything about it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of noise in the space as well about you know people calling sure. software yeah. AI. Um, but yeah, I think recommendations um, probably is kind of one of the big things. Stitch Fix, I think the company you're mentioning, yeah, I exactly, think yes. is doing a great job uh, with that for, mm -hmm. for a different sort of customer. Mm -hmm. um, I think understanding what I, what images are. And mapping that onto recommendations, I think, is another another interesting space. Okay, uh, question from Anonymous: uh, What helped you scale so fast? What, what were the key pillars on which? Yeah, you made this I mean, I, I think it was a sort of obsession from day one about product market fit mm -hmm. and product channel fit. Okay, and um, and this uh, this still was, you know the last meeting I had today in the office about uh, some of the products that we're building. We still look through both of these lenses and like just getting product market fit without a very clear way to scale very quickly in time, just, you know, make sure that we're thinking about both of these things. Yes. And what helped us scale very quickly was realizing that there was, you know, uh, this playbook that had been written in the travel industry or other industries that we could learn from. We hired people from those industries mm -hmm. as well who knew, who knew how that particular thing was made, um, but not too set in their ways that they couldn't tailor it for fashion because there are obviously meaningful differences. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, so three years from now, where do you want to see uh, list? Three years from now? Uh, well, I want to make sure that every hand in the room is up, uh, if, you're, if you're a fashion <laughs> okay. lover. Um, no, I think, I think right now there, there is no dominant app in, in our space, mm -hmm. and I find that super strange. Yes. You know, for every other industry pretty much, there's either one or two or three leading apps. Um, I'm convinced that fashion will be the same, and that's kind of uh, our three-year mission is to make sure that we are the number one fashion shopping app. Uh, globally, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly in our core markets within Europe yes. and the US. And you want to rebrand re to Spotify, or is going to be staying as a list for Spotify profession? <laughs> no, I'm ha happy with the name. I mean, the, yes. na the, na the name, uh, you know, uh, idea of lists is, I think, interesting, but, you know, it's the consonants of the word style. I think it's Scandinavian for desire. Yeah. So, oh, is it? Yeah, we, 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 we kind of figured, we were, like, nervous that it might mean something unfortunate uh -huh. in a different language, and I like think we're okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Morton. Thank you.